So we've already spent a lot of time in class talking about uh, the Colombian Exchange and new trade connections, bringing new parts of the world together. And I guess of primary importance is the development of an entirely new and never used before trade connection, and that is the Atlantic system, bringing what now we can call the, the old world in contact with the new world. But remember, it's kind of odd for all of those people that had lived in the new world to call it the new world because it's only the new world from a European point of view, right? It's only new to those folks that had just discovered it. It had been old hat to those that had always lived there. Um, so we want to talk about labor systems. Remember, we've spent all year, and, and do you guys notice how as we're pushing through this, we always talk about trade, we always talk about labor systems, we always talk about political developments, and when you get to your AP exam at the end of the year, they are going to make you think about one of those things, political systems or, or labor systems or, or trade networks. And on one of your questions, that continuity and change over time question, they're going to make you compare and find some similarities and differences between these eras. Um, so you're going to want to make sure you keep these in mind and how labor systems are going to change. All right? I'm going to start off talking about uh, labor systems in the Latin American nations, uh, the uh, Spanish America. Um, and then we're going to move into uh, the one that had the greatest impact on the Americas, and that is going to be uh, what we call chattel slavery. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So let's start, about, uh, start with the American systems um, employed in Spanish America, and we're going to start with the encomienda system. And you guys read about this, right? Now, one of the most challenging aspects to teaching AP world history is when we get a history degree, uh, when, when you get your qualifications to teach history in, uh, in a school in the state of Michigan, um, you just need to pass a pretty general history test. It's not the most challenging test. Um, and most history teachers, they have to, when they're getting their degree, and I don't even have a history degree. I think I've shared this with you. Mine is, I just have a minor in history. I am hardly qualified to talk to you guys about much of anything. Most of my, my classes, most of my classes were relatively modern history, and I focused a lot on Europe and Russia. I didn't study much at all about what was going on in India. I didn't study about what was going on in China. I've never really given in any in-depth study into, into the Americas. And then you have to teach AP world history. One day you just find out a person that might know a lot about modern European history now has to teach AP world history that covers all aspects of history uh, from beginning to end. And what do we do? Well, we get the book ahead of you guys, and we read it, and we pretend we know what we're talking about, and that's what I'm going to do to you guys today. Uh, for me, a couple, some of the most challenging aspects of teaching AP world history came in the history of Latin America, because I had never done any in-depth study of the history of Latin America. Um, so I... I am like now transposing my understandings now on you guys, and I'm going to believe that this history of Latin America is going to be more challenging for you just because it was more challenging for me because we're all like egocentric, right? If it was hard for me, it's probably going to be hard for you. Well, of course, that makes no sense. Um, many of you guys are more interested in Latin America as young people than I ever was as a young person, and you're probably going to have deeper knowledge. Plus, I understand, uh, raise your hand if you do take Spanish in our program here. Wow. It, that, that must be, there must be a Spanish class writing right now for 10th graders. Uh, so that's just a quirk of our, of our schedule here. Um, I know it, those of our students that are taking Spanish are learning uh, much more about this. So the encomienda system always confused me, even as I started teaching this to kids. And I think I've got it down now. I think I've got it down now to, to make it somewhat... Uh, clear, at least in my head, which helps it be a little bit more clear in your head. We remember the situation when the Spanish conquered the Americas, right? Yeah. And in fact, who do we call those in individuals that conquered? Yeah, very good. We throw a Spanish word at it. We call them conquistadors. So when Hernan Cortez lands in Mexico, 
and he gets some help from, from some local tribes that have an axe to grind, literally and figuratively, with the Aztec people, and they help him on his way to make it to that great Aztec city called? Tenochtitlan. Very good. And ultimately, Hernan Cortez's conquistadors bring down the Aztec Empire. And the same is going to happen in Peru, right? The same is going to happen in Peru when a guy named Francisco Pizarro lands in Peru and he finds a lot of people that had some issues with the Inca. And he gets some assistance making his way uh, to the, uh, the great Incan capital um, to ultimately bring down empire. So you've got the Spaniards and these conquistadors conquering vast swaths of territory, right? And that land wants to be exploited by the, or the, the king, pardon me, this king of Spain, wants to exploit that land for his own riches. Because remember, in this day and age, in the late 1400s into the 1500s, how do nations equate wealth and power? Through land and through the gold and the silver that they can hold on to. And this is going to give rise to this economic system called... Mercantilism. Mercantilism. Very good. Mercantilism. Um, and so for Spain, finding these resources of gold and in particular silver in the Americas um, is crucially important. But they've got a problem. Spain isn't a massively populated nation. Portugal certainly isn't a massively populated nation. But now they're taking over huge swaths of territory. So how are they going to oversee that territory? How are they going to oversee that land? How are they going to work that land? Initially, for the Spanish, it's going to be done in a system known as the encomienda, where the king will grant to these conquistadors, these conquerors or soldiers that were with the conquistadors, the king will grant to them what is known as an encomienda, a, a massive tract of land that will be essentially overseen but not owned. And that's where I always had the, the, the hang up in my head on what was the big difference between encomienda and hacienda. It's going to be overseen but not owned by one of these Spaniards. Okay? Now, these are white dudes from Spain that did the conquering, and they will be granted an encomienda, granted a massive tract of land that will be theirs to oversee. And all of the people that live on that encomienda, if you were unfortunate enough to happen to live within that tract of land, you owed your labor to that individual who controlled the encomienda, or the encomiendor, as he would have been known as. All right? So all of the natives that lived within the encomienda, they essentially had to provide labor for the encomiendor. Whether that be in farming and agriculture work or in mining, they had to provide that labor. Now, over time, what's going to be the issue with these native populations providing the labor for the encomiendor? They don't want to. Well, they may not want to, but they don't have a lot of say because they're going to be treated very harshly, obviously. But they're going to die. And they're going to die in unprecedented and unpredicted numbers, right? Remember, the, the Spaniards in the 16th century have no clue about germ theory or anything like this, all right? And so when we see within a couple centuries, when we see within a couple centuries upwards of 90% of the population of the Americas, the native population of the Americas dying in what is going to be the, the largest human genocide in history. All right? So populations uh, uh, that, that would have numbered in the tens of millions will be reduced to low millions and eventually less than that. They're going, the Spaniards are going to have to find another way to operate this system. All right? Eventually, the encomienda system morphs largely into the hacienda system, where individuals, again, will be now granted or given an estate. Now they're not just controlling something for the, the, the king, all right? They're given their own plot of land. Now, the haciendas are often going to be smaller. Oh, here, here we go, a graphical representation of Native American population um, with, a, after the first arrival of, of Europeans. Okay, so by the time we get to about 120 years after Europeans have first arrived, 
Native American populations are decimated, but then again, we can't even use the word decimated because decimated means like one-tenth. In fact, we've got to go to like decimated times nine, right? Almost 90% of that population is going to be gone. So the Hacienda, or the Encomienda system will morph into the Hacienda system, where rather than a large tract of land being controlled by this Encomiendor, who can then exploit the, the native population on that land, smaller pieces of land will eventually be just given. You will own your hacienda. Okay? So powerful elites or people connected to the king will then be given a smaller tract of land that will be known as a hacienda, but it will be theirs to own. This is all the king's land still. All right? Now the hacienda becomes your private estate, essentially. And as your private estate, you oversee how everything will be worked. Now, if there are natives still within your hacienda, you can use them. But by this time, most of them are gone. So it's your now responsibility to work your land the way you see fit, whether that be the importation of the purchase of slaves to work your land, and we'll talk much more about slavery in a few minutes, or hiring private labor, right? And actually free labor to, to pay for it the encomienda system eventually turns in to the hacienda system. All right? It's about state ownership versus private ownership. It's about using native populations as your forced labor versus later having to use possibly natives if they're still around or, or slave labor. Okay? I always had a hard time wrapping my head around the difference between encomienda and hacienda. Largely, it's a time issue. In early Spanish colonialism, we were dealing largely with the encomienda system. In later Spanish colonialism, we're dealing with the hacienda system. Now, what is important to remember, guys, obviously there's an underclass, whether they be natives or they be African slaves that have been imported. There's an underclass that is working the land. And then we begin to see a rise of the elite. In, in the Americas, in the Spanish American colonies. Those that either control the encomienda or eventually own the haciendas. All right? And these guys, what are they going to have in common? Different from those laborers? They're rich and they're white. They're, most of them are going to be from Spain, especially in the earlier years. Good? I had a hand somewhere. Yes, sir? Yeah, um, I have two questions, actually. Though. Yeah. With the encomienda... encomienda. Yeah. The Kamiyan doors and the Hasmian doors, would they have to still pay tax to the king even though the Hasmian doors owe yeah, them? Yes, yeah. They're, they're still going to be, like, initially with the Kamiyan door, all the production from that land is the king's. Um, eventually, the Hacienda, there will be taxes that they will be paying to the state. Yes, yeah, so that goes to, like, the, pro the, the produces that the Kamiyan doors get. Is that theirs to keep, or do you have to give everything to the king? It's, it's ultimately controlled by the king, but they will be living a, a good life. Yeah? Uh, the death of Native American populations and the inability to work massive tracts of land without land, without, and, and what incentive, I, I guess this is a good point. If you don't actually own the land, if you are just kind of working it for the king or controlling it for the king, what incentive do you have to go out and purchase slaves? What incentive do you have to, to, pay, to pay labor for you? But when it's your own land, now you have an incentive. You have a vested interest to, to work that land. So this, with the death of the native population that could be used as slaves, will morph into the hacienda system. All right. The other system that the, the natives will do, uh, that the Spaniards will use in the Americas, um, and what we're going to see, we've already talked about this mountain in, in, uh, Sp in uh, Spanish America and South America, what is today Bolivia, called Potosi. This is that massive mountain, that, this vein of, of silver uh, that the Spaniards would exploit. This is obviously in South America, in present-day Bolivia, which is in the Andes Mountains which was previously controlled by what Native American empire? The Incans. And the Incans themselves had a system of forced labor that we've talked about called? Mita. The Mita system. M-I-T apostrophe A, right? The Mita system. 
where every single Incan had to give, uh, every single Incan subject had to give of their time for labor for the state. Now, for the Inca, this would have been in, like, road building or constructing terraced farming. But for the Spaniards, it's primarily going to be used for mining and mining silver. Now, this was a horribly dangerous job, all right? Uh, you guys did, possibly in your reading, what, what made the mining of silver so particularly dangerous uh, in, in Latin America? Yes, sir? Okay, you, you could have your mines collapse on you, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Um, there was, a, there was a, a certain poisonous chemical that would be used uh, to, to help extract the, the silver from the ore, and that was? Lead. Not lead. Mercury, very good. An amalgam of mercury would be used. Now, I am no chemistry teacher, so I can't get, to get into the weeds about explaining how one uses mercury to help extract uh, uh, silver. But suffice it to say, mercury was used to extract the silver, but we know that mercury is... For example, if a mercury thermometer were to be broken in a classroom, you've got to clear out. Get that stuff cleaned up. It's not safe to be around, right? While these natives were made to work with the stuff. Um, just with their hands with no protection whatsoever because they didn't understand the danger presented. So this was a horribly dangerous job, but this is how in South America that, that the, the Spanish colonialists would extract labor. Now, in some ways, this allowed popu uh, uh, native populations to per persevere for a little bit longer in South America. Because the Mita system was like a, a conscription for a small part of the year, all right? You wouldn't be permanently, you know, for the entire course of your life, be owned by these colonialists. You would give your time and your labor, and then you would go back home. So we would see a little bit of a, a slower uh, progression of death and destruction due to diseases in, in South America than you would in, in, uh, in Central America. Okay, good? So here's a great example of, of the Europeans simply adopting an idea that the, the, span, that the Incan had used before, all right, using the, the Mita system themselves. All right, we're going to spend the majority of our time today talking about the African slave trade. Again, ding, ding, ding. I've tried to stop you over the last few weeks whenever we're talking about some event, some seminal event in history. That, that creates such a dramatic change that you have to recognize there was something different before and now there's going to be something different forever after. And now we're going to talk about what is known as the African diaspora. We've used that word before, right? The African diaspora. Diaspora or a diasporic event refers to like a spreading out of a population, all right? We've talked about that before with the Jewish diaspora back in the year 70 CE when the Romans smashed the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and Jews fled from, from their homeland throughout the world, whether it be further in the Middle East or North Africa or up into Europe. Here's the African diaspora. This is a far bigger event than the Jewish diaspora was just because the, the sheer numbers of people involved. The population of Jews in 70 CE was relatively small. In the African diaspora, we're talking of upwards of 12 million people taken from West Africa, taken across the Atlantic, and brought to the Americas for slave labor. But that 12 million people is, is not even a great number to think about because there's going to be countless millions more that history can't possibly remember. All right? So when we deal with the 12 million number, we're talking about the number of slaves that actually make it to the Americas. How many more were lost on this journey known as the Middle Passage? How many more were lost as they were taken from, from the interior of West Africa, captured, kidnapped, and taken to the coastline? We're talking millions and millions of other individuals um, who will be lost not only to African society but, but to the world at large. So this event, this, this diasporic event, it's the biggest forced migration in human history, all right? 
Now, there are other forced migrations where people are made to move from one part of the world to another part of the world. You guys remember last year talking about the forced movement of Native Americans and the Trail of Tears. But that is, is relatively, uh, not even relative, that is absolutely small compared to the forced migration of Africans across the Atlantic um, in, in what is known as the, the African slave system. All right, this is chattel slavery. And you guys had that word last year, I believe, come up, right? No. Some of you have seen it, some may not. Chattel slavery. This refers to the slaves are not in any sense of the word considered human beings at all. They're considered property to be owned, much like somebody would own an ox or a cow, cattle or something, or a horse. Uh, they were merely chattel. They were property of the slave owner. All right? And this slave event. Now, slavery is not new, and we've talked about slavery throughout the course of this class, right? Like, give me a classical civilization. Rome. That, thank you. Yeah. You didn't let me answer the question. Ask the question. A classical civilization that heavily relied on slavery. Rome is a good example. The Greek, some of the Greek world, good examples. These places that, especially places that were heavily involved in military expansion. Because when you're sending your guys off to fight in constant warfare, you need somebody back home to work. And so Rome would be a great example of a classic civilization that employed slavery. We talked in the last era, all right, in the post-classical era, about slavery in the Islamic world. All right? Especially the importation of women, and many of them coming from West Africa. The importation of women into the Middle East uh, to serve as domestic servants or, or to work in, in harems and things like this. This slavery incident in human history, though, is different than, than any other before. And it's different for a lot of reasons. And I want to I touch on, on some of those reasons. All right? First, the unprecedented numbers, all right? Numbers of slaves that, had not, that we cannot see in any society, in any human civilization before are going to be imported to the Americas from Africa. So the numbers, first, make it different, make it unique. These slaves will also be unique in that they have absolutely no rights within the society that they're entering. Now, do you guys remember last year looking at Hammurabi's code? Yes. And one thing that we remember about Hammurabi's code is that there's like this absolute delineation between social class, right? Like if, if you um, kill, if you, if you slap your neighbor who's on an equal status with you, you're going to be in trouble. But if you slap your neighbor's slave, there's probably not going to be much repercussions there. But the sole fact that slaves were mentioned, were included, and in words, some respect, protected because, like, if you kill a slave, there's going to be some kind of punishment going out to the, the, the perpetrator of that crime, right? There, there's at least some semblance of that slave being a part of that society, all right? In American slavery, they weren't even considered as, as, as humans, all right? They weren't even considered uh, as, as any aspect to that society. So this is different. Their status had ex very limited chance of ever ending, okay? A, a slave was only on the rarest occasions ever freed. You would be born a slave, or captured in, in, for the earliest, taken to the Americas, but then if you had children once in the Americas, your children would be born slaves, your grandchildren would be born slaves, and this wouldn't end until the institution of slavery will come to an end. And when does slavery come to an end? Yeah, if you're in the United States, it's 1865, ultimately. We can say 1863 because of the Emancipation Proclamation, but we remember that, that the Southerners didn't really follow Abraham Lincoln in 1863. If you were in a British colony, it ended earlier. The Brits actually ended it earlier in the very early 1800s. Does anybody know the last colony to ultimately, or last region of the Americas, to actually end slavery? Yes? Oh, America? No. Canada? No, 
Canada actually did early, but they were connected with the Brits. The Brazilians. The Brazilians, and it's just an easy number for me to remember, so it might be for easy for you, in 1888. So as late as 1888, you know, a full generation after the United States ended their institution of slavery, Brazil would end theirs. So there was very, very little chance at what is known as manumission, or to get freedom, all right? Or emancipation, maybe you could use that word. Another difference in this slavery compared to other systems of slavery in history is that it is tied to race like no other time before. So if you were to go back to, to ancient Rome and to look at the slaves that would have been owned in ancient Rome, there would have been white folks, there would have been people that were from the Middle East, there would have been black Africans. There would have been all different kinds of people that would have ended up as slaves. Because slaves could have become slaves for a variety of reasons. How does one become a slave in, in ancient Rome? Yes, sir? Too much debt. Maybe you are in debt. Maybe you just owe a lot of money that you can't pay, and now you are giving of your life and labor to pay those debts. Alex? Conquered. Maybe you were conquered in war. All right, most slaves are going to be come through, through being conquered in warfare. Well, the Romans were fighting a lot of people, right? So it wouldn't just be Europeans or Africans or Middle Easterners that the Romans were expanding to and taking slaves from. Those are the primary reasons historically that, that individuals would become slaves, through, through conquest and war and, and through indebtedness. In this case, it is exclusively African slaves being taken across what is going to be known as the Middle Passage. We'll talk about that in a moment. It is exclusively African. So we have now slavery being associated with race, which had never really happened before. All right? Never happened before. And if you have to, you don't have to anymore, wonder, why does the United States have the issues of, of race and racism that we deal with and, and which are also present in many other parts of the Americas? Because for, for centuries, and we're talking about 400 years of history of slavery in the Americas, for centuries, most white Americans, and I don't just mean United States Americans, but most whites in the Americas associated Africans, or black people, with the institution of slavery, a subhuman institution. So it shouldn't be surprising that so many, even, even now more than a century after we ended our institution of slavery, that so many in our culture still have issues from that 400 years of history before. All right? There are massive lasting impacts because of the institution of slavery throughout the Americas. Yes? Um, you, were, you were talking about how, how this system uh, left the slaves with like, literally no freedom, like no rights. Mm -hmm. Like, how could you contrast that with, with the previous, previous civil rights? Like good, good question. So in, in Rome, for example, in Rome, for example, you might be a slave, but you might have a place in the house. And not just, like, be, as being a servant within the house, but you might actually be, like, a functioning member of that household. And you might, you might sit down for meals with the family, all right? This would happen in, in traditional African slavery, which... White, my point, white Europeans did not invent slavery. We want to make sure we know that. It was always there. But the slavery that they used is, is a new kind. So, so, so slaves from earlier uh, civilizations might have had roles and responsibilities within the home that put them on, on somewhat of an equal level outside of their slave status with other members of that household. All right? They might have been free to... to go into town and to come back and, and without having the, the, the stigma of slavery like we'll eventually see it. But remember too, in Rome, if slaves could be white or black or, or Middle Eastern or anything else that, that the Romans would have come in contact with, you wouldn't have known if you were walking through town. For example, if you were in, in Haiti, what becomes Haiti, all right, which was a French colony um, and they, they primarily grew sugar if you were black and in Haiti in 1750, you were a slave. If you were black and in Rome in the year 50, you might have been a slave. You might not. Because Rome was a cosmopolitan city and had people from all over the world milling about. So, so I think that's the biggest distinction there. In the Americas, 
slavery was, was ever present, but it was exclusively for, for, for these black Africans, which separates them um, very obviously, very clearly. Yeah, this is a okay. very uncomfortable topic, and especially like, you know, not for me, but I'm saying it over, or in general for it, a it, lot it, of reasons. It's an uncomfortable, yeah, this is, yeah. This is, okay, this is the kind of stuff that, that we should appreciate the idea that we're allowed to teach in the way we are and that we acknowledge these, these wrongdoings of our past. History, for, for much of human history, the existence of history was, was created to glorify the state that was in charge, right? It, it, was, it was made to glorify the rulers. Like, the, you guys have heard the line, um, the, the victors write their history. The, the people that win the wars write their story, and they want to glorify it, right? So we always have to be a little suspect about what we're reading and who's writing it. Well, this is the institution of slavery, and we, we haven't even talked about the worst yet, is a, a massive black mark on American society, not just the United States, but all of the Americas. But it's not ignored, right? It's not ignored. Um, it's certainly taught in schools, and, uh, and, and, and that's a good thing that we recognize it. But it's not an easy conversation, especially when you bring it to racial issues of today. Um, guys, there, there are still, uh, and, and it is a vibrant debate in the United States, um, if, if the sons and daughters of, of slavery in the Americas, or in the United States at least, are owed reparations for their, for their family's history, right? Uh, it's not unprecedented. Uh, in the aftermath, uh, in the 1990s, the United States government uh, offered payments and reparations to the families of Japanese Americans who lost their property in the 1940s when the United States essentially imprisoned and took, uh, took uh, land and property away from Japanese Americans in California, for example. And reparations were paid. There's been, there's a, there's a vibrant argument and debate about whether the sons and daughters of, of, of former slaves, or, or slaves themselves, um, are, are owed something by the American society that they helped build. So this is absolutely an issue. Guys, if you followed anything about like the Black Lives Matter movement and the racial protests that have, have come around in the last year or two, um, you can see that this is an important story and, and a difficult one to talk about. All right, I'm going to press on a little bit. and. Uh, Talk about, um, oh, another massive difference between this slavery, this slavery and earlier examples. For example, when West Africa was trading slaves across that trans-Saharan trade network to the Middle East, women were preferred two to one to male slaves, all right? Women could fetch higher prices. So two, by a two to one ratio, women were, were, uh, were traded across the trans-Saharan trade network uh, to, to the Middle East. The American slave trade primarily searched for men, especially earlier on. The American slave trade was primarily looking for men. Men could fetch higher prices because of the labor that they were going to be doing. Here, slaves uh, imported to the Middle East were primarily serving in the homes of the wealthy. Shipped to the Americas, slaves were primarily working on sugarcane plantations physically harsh labor that it was seen that men were better suited for. So we're going to see in the transatlantic slave trade a disproportionate number of men. And so when we talk about slavery disrupting societies, we have to recognize that this institution is going to bring great change to many societies. Obviously, starting with West Africa. If you, over a 400-year period, are having some of your youngest, some of your strongest, some of your best and some of your brightest, especially men in the population, being pulled out of your population and sent to another part of the world. What are you left with? You know, you, you, you've a preponderance of, of women, but you're also left with a lot of, uh, without a lot of your talent. Talent that may have one day been able to continue to build vibrant societies. But if you wonder, why, why does Africa have so many problems today? And we can create a, a laundry list of reasons. We have to start with the European involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. We have to start with that, all right? 
taking millions of people that would have otherwise stayed in West Africa building societies. They were taken out. And then eventually all of Africa is going to be colonized, and we'll talk about that story as well. But, but this is going to have a dramatic impact on West African societies. Uh, back in the back, Hannah. Okay, that is a great question because here's where we start and, and, and you will always have somebody mention, in fact, I just saw it on YouTube, a kind of a snarky comment. Wait a minute, the Africans were kidnapping themselves, right? It was, it was West African, it was West Africans living on the coast of Africa who were dealing with the Portuguese or dealing with the Spaniards or later dealing with French traders or British traders. It was West Africans who were going inland to snatch up Africans. So Africans were trading Africans. And again, this is, I think, problematic. And this is Eurocentric or, or Anglocentric in saying that, like, wait a minute. Are all Africans the same? No. Now, to the outsiders who can only see the skin color and can't really recognize any difference beyond that, You'd say, oh, yeah, they're all the same. They're kidnapping themselves. They are to blame. Well, no. West African states, West African states that were doing business with these European traders, remember, trading guns and finished products and pots and pans and utensils and such for these slaves, did, they, did these West African tribes have any affinity for the interior African people? No. They were different. Right? They weren't of the same state. They weren't of the same background. Now, there might have been cultural connections, and we talked about the Bantu migration, spreading language roots and such, but these are different people. They're as different as Frenchmen are from Germans. They're as different as, as, as Indians are, uh, South Indians are from North Indians, or as Chinese people from the East are different from Chinese people in the North and Chinese people in the West. They're different people. It is, a, it is a vast misunderstanding of humanity. And it's, this is, I think I've mentioned this phrase. Have you ever heard, said the phrase ugly, ugly American to you guys before? The ugly American is a phrase that was born in the last century for essentially this, this, this viewpoint that Americans, many Americans, not all of us, but many Americans just don't have much cultural understanding for, for some very obvious reasons. For example, I have been to one other nation in my life, and it was Canada. And the extent of my journeys through Canada pretty much draw a line from Detroit to Windsor to Niagara Falls and back. That was it. You guys are going to see Niagara Falls very soon, right? Madame Bonas, how many countries have you been to in your life? Maybe uh, 10, maybe something like 10, maybe. Maybe. Okay, but, but you can't even count it. Like, had I been to one other country besides Canada, I'd be like, two. I've been to two. Had I been to three other countries, had I made like a summer trip to Germany when I was in high school, had my wife and I not started our family quite as soon as we did, we might have gone to France. Um, who knows? But if I had been to two or three or four countries, I could easily say two or three or four countries. But I understand, once you get to like seven, eight, nine, well, now you have to stop and think and... Oh, yeah, I've been to a lot of places. Most Americans are like me. Most Americans are like me, largely ignorant of the world around them. Everything I know about the world around me is from speaking to people that have been there or from what I read, all right? And that's kind of sad. I'm bummed out about that. But why is that somewhat understandable for us Americans? Here's how Madame Bonesse goes to Germany. I'm in Germany now, all right? Well, ever, ever since the borders were started to be etched away a little bit with the European Union and a common currency, it's so easy. Hey, I'm in Germany, now I'm in Switzerland. And I'm back in France, now I can go to Austria and I can go to Italy and it's that easy. It's as easy, and in fact, I think it's even easier for you to do. Do you, even need, do you need a passport to, to go from one nation to another? Yeah, so it is, it is literally easier for her to go into Germany. Two countries that have fought the two most massive wars against each other in the 20th century. She can more easily walk into to, to Germany than I can walk into Canada. Wow, or swim into Canada, or whatever, however I was going to get to Canada. 
All right? So, so most Americans don't have much of a concept of the world around them. So if you were to ask, if you were to ask the average American about um, what, what does an African look like, they'd probably describe a black African with no acknowledgement of what's going on north of the Sahara Desert or no acknowledgement of all the white folks that live in South Africa or no acknowledgement of Farah being from Egypt, right? If you were to ask the average American of what a, an Asian person looks like, they'd probably picture a Japanese person or a Chinese person with no acknowledgement that, that, no acknowledgement that one-sixth of the world's population lives in India. And they're all Asian. So, it, and it's, it's, it's just an, under, an understanding that most just don't have, all right? So I think that argument that says, but whoa, 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 wasn't, weren't Africans kidnapping themselves? No, Africans weren't kidnapping themselves. There was no themselves for Africans, all right? There wasn't an idea that all Africans on that continent are in solidarity with each other. Now, what wouldn't happen? Me, as a, a West African, if I were, I wouldn't have been, like, kidnapping my brother or my sister, or I wouldn't have been taking my next-door neighbor unless he was a real rotten guy, all right? <laughs> Didn't like him very much. I wouldn't have been taking people from my own community, right? But my own community is my community that I have an affinity for. People that live 50 miles, 100 miles inland that I have no contact with, they're different. What have, what, have, what have people throughout human society, whether they be, they be Chinese or the ancient Greeks, what have we always thought of the other? They're the barbarians. They're others. They're different. And so just as it wouldn't, wouldn't have been like, just as it wouldn't have been uh, uh, a, a, an issue for somebody in Greece to have a slave who was even formerly a Greek subject, right, because of maybe indebtedness. It, it, it wouldn't have been weird or, or wrong for a West African to enslave other West Africans because they had no affinity for each other. They weren't a part of the same political entity or same cultural entity. They had similarities, but they weren't the same. So I think we need to stop. So, so why were Africans capturing and enslaving other Africans for sale? Yes. Yeah, they're using them for profit. They're getting guns from Europeans, which makes their state stronger and allows them to expand. So you will see some West African states actually grow from this. It's all for profit, guys. It's all to make money. And if, if, if in this era, if white slavers from Europe, whether they be Portugal or Spain or France or Britain, if, if white or, or the Dutch... If white slavers were offering payment for slaves, guess what you would find? Slaves. And you wouldn't shed a tear because their skin color was the same as yours. Because you in West Africa did not view skin color as uniting people. It's only in the modern world that we view skin color as importantly as we do, right? Yes, ma'am. There might have been some trade with each other. There might have been some trade. But eventually when European powers come knocking on the door saying, hey, we've got a lot of guns. If you can provide us with slaves, we will do this. Okay, when we're talking about going to remote locations, we're in some cases talking about 20, 30, 40 miles inland. So we're not, we're not talking about going on the other side of the continent. Um, and... and What's, you, you go to the easiest place you can go to, I would have to imagine, right? Like, I'm in my own community, and I don't want to take any of these people as slaves because they know me. I'm in my own community. I'm in my, now I'm out of my community. Now I can capture these people because they're not like me. Their language might be a little different. Their belief systems might be a little different. They're not me, and I can take them, and I, I will not shed a tear because some white guy from Europe is going to give my kingdom some guns, and it's okay. Okay? Uh-huh. Eventually, they're going to be very aware of what's going on. Absolutely. They're, they're going to know. And in fact, this was cruel in and of itself. 
all right? Um, stories will make their rounds about what the middle passage is like. We'll talk about that in a moment. Stories will make their rounds. They will absolutely know. But guys, human beings, we tend to be a greedy lot, don't we? We do a lot for, for money. And we also, hey, are there evil things in the world right now that you know about? Yeah. Donald <laughs> 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 Are there evil things that we know about that we don't necessarily do anything about? Yeah. yeah. Bad things happen. And, and guys, if, if we spent every waking hour, if we spent every waking hour thinking about the horrors that exist in the world, I don't think we'd have many waking hours, right? We would just stay curled up in our beds, not being able to, to go out and enjoy our lives. So we, we find ways to get over it or ignore it. We don't turn on, like, literally, I, I hear it in my house a lot. Turn off the news. You know, it's just bad news. Nothing but, so you turn it off. If you don't look at it, it's not happening, at least for the time being, right? And, and we find ways to, to disconnect. And I, ha I have to imagine West Africans who knew what was happening, maybe they were bummed out about it. Maybe they found their own ways to disconnect. Maybe the riches their society was bringing in made that much easier. Guys, is it easier to disconnect when we've got everything that we could ever need around us? Absolutely. Absolutely. But then also we have to remember, we have to remember, and I think there's to some extent this is true as well. Um, right now our community cares a lot and thinks a lot about Flint, right? And the, the, the situation in Flint, and many of you have probably already donated something. Time, water, something, money, whatever. We're all thinking about the situation in Flint and what a disaster that is. But that's an hour away from us, right? For, Flint has had massive issues for, for, for decades, right? This isn't new, but it, we've only just had our eyes opened up to it. Other big cities in the United States have got massive issues. But we don't have our eyes open to those situations all the time, you know? So I, I think it's just... Uh, we only have a capacity for so much ability to think about what's going on around us. But those, those West African states that were, in, that were kidnapping and then trading these slaves, we still have to remember that these were not people to them. All right? This wasn't their brother. This wasn't their cousin. These were not people to them. These were a currency that they used to trade with Europeans to get the products they wanted from Europeans. And by the same notion, the white slavers, why couldn't the white slavers on those ships recognize the evil that they were doing to those people? Because they weren't people to them. Once you kind of peel away the humanity from someone, once you stop recognizing them as a, a viable human being, it's pretty easy to do a lot of horrible things. All right? And we will talk as we press on to this in this year about dehumanization in like 20th century warfare, for example. It's a lot of bad things happen once you peel away that humanity. Um, one more comment, then we're going to press on and finish this up. Yeah. Um, so uh, how, how, do, how exactly do they, do they do this? Because if, 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 is it because there's like no, uh, like either weaker countries or are there no organizations? Okay, good, good question. How is this happening? Well, when the first slaves are captured, and literally kidnapped, like they're, they're out tending their fields, or they're out with their animals, grazing their animals, and, and a couple people might be kidnapped. And they're taken to the coast, and they say, we've got a couple slaves to trade you. And then the Europeans trade those slaves for some guns and some gunpowder. Well, now what does that West African state have? Guns and gunpowder. Guns and gunpowder make it easy to go easier to go capture more slaves. Then you capture more slaves, you trade it, you get more guns. It makes your state stronger. It makes it easier to go out and get more slaves, right? Or maybe some deals start being made with, with inland states. Like, hey, now, now the coastal state has a lot of weapons, has a lot of firepower. They could overrun your civilization. And we will, unless you pay us, what have we called it through history? Tribute. tribute. But not tribute in the form of grain or tribute in the form of gold or silver, but tribute in the form of slaves. So now you go capture your own slaves so you can keep the West African state off your back, right? So, yeah, we have to erase this notion, though, that they're kidnapping all the same people. They're different. All right, so let's run through a couple more, uh, couple more things. Uh, we talked about how this, this changed. 
Originally, uh, the, the first seeds of what would eventually become the transatlantic slave trade is born in the Mediterranean Sea and in the islands off the coast of Africa. So long before, long, we'll look at this map here, long before uh, the importation of slaves into the Americas, so we're talking mid-1400s, because we know in what year did Columbus sail the ocean blue? That's got to be our line of demarcation then, okay? So before 1492, there were no slaves over here because there were no Europeans over here. So in the mid-1400s, when Prince Henry, for example, is first setting up shop in North Africa, there's going to be a recognition. Uh, Western Europeans are going to learn during this era from the, the Crusades and after, are going to learn about the wonders of sugar. American society knows all about it, all right? It begins for Western Europeans in the aftermath of the Crusades because sugar came from the East, all right? Sugar came from the East. And Europeans making their way into the Middle East would come in contact with this. And eventually, realize it could be quite profitable. And Western Europeans, largely Spaniards and Portuguese, would start building plantations, massive farms, with the goal of producing one cash crop. And that earliest cash crop was going to be sugarcane. And these would be in the Mediterranean Sea. These earliest islands in the Mediterranean Sea that would be used for growing sugar. And they needed labor for these. And these islands didn't have large populations, so you'd have to bring in labor. And in some cases, the labor that they brought in would be slave labor. In fact, literally, where the word Slavic, my marker's dying, where the word Slavic for the Slavs of Eastern Europe, that word Slavic has in its roots the same as, as slave. Because Slavic peoples from around the Black Sea would be kidnapped and taken by the Byzantine Empire and traded on the Mediterranean Sea routes, sea trade, for people looking for slaves. And so these Slavic peoples became, in many respects, slaves on plantations in the Mediterranean. But in 1453, what happens? It's a big year. That's a ding, ding, ding year. 1453, Constantinople Falls. In 1453, Constantinople Falls. Don't you remember that, that old classic children's ditty we talked about? Once upon a time in 1453, Constantinople fell like a tree? No. no. Uh, maybe I just made that up. I don't know. So 1453, Constantinople Falls. Who takes over Constantinople? The Ottomans. The Ottomans. Constantinople becomes Istanbul. Guess what? The trade connections, the trade connections between the Slavic slaves in around the Black Sea and the Christian slavers in the Mediterranean, their, their slaves dried up because they're not doing business with the Ottomans anymore because they're Muslims. You don't want to do business with them. All right? So, right, can so conveniently... At the same time, access to slaves from Slavic areas ends, Prince Henry the Navigator is starting to venture into North Africa. And Portuguese sailors are learning how to go out to sea because of Prince Henry's school. And they're going to come in contact with West Africa, who is already engaged in selling slaves on the trans saharan Trade Network. Right, Sophia? Already engaged in doing that. So what's the difference for them in trading slaves to white European Portuguese versus uh, traders in the Middle East? No difference, right? Well, one big difference, the Portuguese will give you guns. And so at the same time Constantinople falls, Portugal is starting to venture into West Africa. And so on the islands, like islands like the Canaries and the Madeiras, little islands off the coast of Africa, plantations will be born and they will, for the first time, use black African slaves. In the Americas, Portugal will use the same thing they did on these little islands and import slaves into Brazil. Brazil is going to be the first American colony that will receive uh, slaves. Through the course of the history of slavery, with most of them working in, in uh, with most of them working in sugarcane plantations in the American South, the vast majority of slaves that will enter into the Americas go to South America and Brazil, 
or the Caribbean. Notice what happens to the Americas. Despite the important role that slavery played in the history of the United States, we import a very small percentage of slaves. Now that is not because we were more benevolent or nicer than anybody else. But slaves in the Americas, slaves in the United States, did different jobs. Slaves going to South America and slaves going to the Caribbean, they had two primary jobs, both of them horribly deadly. One was mining, the other was sugarcane plantations. All right? Sugarcane plantations are horribly dangerous because, one, you're working in, like, tropical and subtropical heat, all right? Ridiculously hot. Two, you're wielding machetes. You're walking through sugarcane fields and hucking machetes, and accidents happen, all right? So life expectancies for slaves was very low in these kinds of conditions. So you had to continuously import new slaves to replace those that are dying. Whereas slaves that made it to the Americas, not that they would have a good existence at all, they'd still be slaves. They were primarily working in what two industries? Cotton and tobacco. Really, tobacco predated cotton, but tobacco plantations and then cotton plantations. Laborious work, but not nearly as dangerous. For example, when one is picking cotton, he's literally picking a bowl of cotton off of a cotton plant and then working his way to get the seeds out. It is tedious. It has got to be horrible. It is mindless work. I couldn't imagine doing it for an hour, let alone a lifetime. But it's not deadly like these jobs were. All right? We're going to pause here. And we're going to pick up that. conclude our talk about uh, the African slave trade um, by talking about how African slaves proved ultimately to be the best option uh, for, for these European, uh, Europeans in demand of, of labor as Native Americans were dying of those European diseases. Indentured servants, you guys remember the talk about that last year in APUSH, indentured servants, these people that would trade their labor for maybe seven years for um, the, the funds to make the passage across the Atlantic. Indentured servitude was expensive. And the Africans were largely immune to those European diseases. Remember, they were old world diseases, and Africa was in the old world. So the Africans were largely immune from these old world diseases. Many of them were already experienced agricultural laborers. And there was already an established West African trade network in slaves. It's not like Europeans had to invent the trade of slaves in West Africa. They just entered in and then changed a, uh, an already established network. I'm going to talk briefly about the stages of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, first and foremost, as we've already mentioned, uh, slaves would be captured in the interior, kidnapped, taken to the coast for sale. And when they're taken to the west coast of Africa, they're going to be held in what are known as factories. All right? Uh, now, these are not like assembly factories, but um, factories in the sense that they, they housed these African uh, slaves for, uh, for, for trade uh, across the Atlantic. So fortresses, essentially like this, would sprout up along the, the west African coast that would house these, these people until they would be uh, ultimately transported by, uh, by Europeans across what was known as the Middle Passage. The Middle Passage, because it's that, like that second chain in the triangular trade system, the Middle Passage is the journey from Africa to the Americas on slave ships. So a, a ship like this, and, and this is just a, a horrid uh, drawing, and you guys can see how each one of these is a, a figure who is chained together on the bottom deck, on the second deck of the ship. And the trip would take from one to six months, depending on how early in the slave trade process we're dealing. Obviously, ships would get faster as we get into the 1800s. And then what kind of weather the ships would, would run into. So one to six months, depending on weather, but faster in the later years. So closer to the one, one and a half months uh, time. Typically, slaves were chained together for most of the day and night below deck. Uh, 
the close quarters that these slaves were meant to, to spend their hours uh, with each other um, led to rampant spread of disease uh, like dysentery. Um, death was not uncommon on the Middle Passage, in which case if slaves were to die en route, uh, they would simply be thrown overboard. Ultimately, those that survived the Middle Passage would then be put up for auction and for sale in the United States or in Latin America or in the Caribbean or in Brazil. So the sale was typically auction style in the Americas. By the numbers, the vast majority of slaves traded from the 1500s, or, or pardon me, mid-1400s until the mid-1800s uh, were traded in the latter chunk of that time from the late 1600s through the early 1800s would be the peak in the slave trade to the Americas. We've got some numbers here too that will, will make it clear to us where the vast majority of those slaves from Africa would make it into the Americas. In the 17th and 18th century, and then we can look at the total numbers, the majority of slaves that entered the Americas from Africa during this time period were going to Brazil. One out of every three slaves was going to Brazil. Brazil's primary cash crop, sugar. Next, we've got uh, the Caribbean with 22% going to the British Caribbean, another 6% of slaves going to the Fre uh, Dutch Caribbean, another 20% of slaves going to the French Caribbean. The French Caribbean is almost exclusively today the nation of Haiti. All right? So in massive numbers of slaves, and what's the primary crop of those Caribbean uh, colonies? Sugar. sugar. All right? So where sugar was grown, slaves were in the highest demand. And then British North America, ultimately, and eventually the, the United States, ultimately would receive um, a relatively small percentage compared to their, their counterparts. Again, the primary crops there were cotton and tobacco. Not necessarily um, freeing you from a life of servitude and labor, but not the deadly dangerous labor that we would see in the Caribbean and in Brazil. All right? Questions, comments, concerns? 